My name is Diane Dutoy. I'm a clinical nurse consultant for dialysis and vascular access. I've been using ultrasound in the renal setting for about 13 years now. I'm going to be talking to you today about using ultrasound measurement of blood flow volume in dialysis, arteriovenous fistulas and grafts. The objectives today will describe blood flow volume monitoring and the benefits, the ultrasound anatomy of arteriovenous fistulas and arteriovenous grafts, We'll discuss ultrasound volume flow monitoring. We'll look at the equipment and software used. Uh, we'll look at understanding color and pulse wave Doppler. We'll look at performing the actual volume flow calculation. Uh, we'll look at some results and some clinical pearls from my experience. So blood flow monitoring. In arteriovenous fissures and arteriovenous grass, the volume flow, or uh, what we call it in dialysis, the access flow, is the amount of blood flowing through an arteriovenous fissure or arteriovenous graft in millilitres per minute or mils per minute. We need a volume flow higher than the dialysis pump speed to prevent recirculation of blood. So, for example, if the volume flow of an arteriovenous fissure was 300 mils per minute, but we wanted to set the pump at 350 mils per minute, we wouldn't be providing enough blood for the pump to function or we would be causing recirculation. So we do need to have a volume flow that would support the amount of blood that we need to put through the dialysis machine. And this is uh, demonstrated in a video here. Blood flow monitoring benefits. We can do a single measurement of a blood flow volume. Uh, this is in isolation, gives us a little bit of an idea at least of what the fistula or graft is running at. However, we also like to look at the trend because a downward trend in the volume flow can indicate an issue such as a significant stenosis in the fistula or graft. It promotes early detection and preemptive intervention of significant stenosis to minimise underdialysis and AV fissure thrombosis. So we use it uh, in the units that I've worked in regularly. We do volume flow or access flow measurements, uh, sometimes monthly, sometimes twice monthly, and sometimes in the home population only every three months. It really does depend on the fissure, but regular volume flow monitoring, in my experience, really helps us detect issues and intervene early. Blood flow monitoring, there's a few guidelines out there that support us doing regular blood flow monitoring. The National Kidney Foundation, the KDOKI guidelines, say that surveillance in the fistula, the preferred method is direct flow measurements. They don't say specifically how we do those flow measurements, but they just recommend that we do direct flow measurements to perform surveillance. The Kidney Health Australian carry guidelines, we call them. They talk about vascular access surveillance and they recommend that regular access flow screening increases the detection of AV fistula stenosis compared to clinical examination, low arterial pressure or recirculation measurements alone. The regular access flow screening with preemptive repair, and they talk about either angioplasty or surgery, reduces arteriovenous fistula thrombosis and may prolong arteriovenous fistula survival. And the European Best Practice Guidelines, under their guideline of surveillance of vascular access, objective monitoring of access function should be performed at a regular base by measuring access flow. And again, volume flow, access flow are all interchangeable. So we'll look at the blood flow through an arteriovenous fissure or arteriovenous graft. There are obviously different types of fissures and grafts out there. We'll talk about those, give you some examples. But when we look at the blood flow in uh, arteries and veins in our body, we know that the pump, the heart, creates the pressure wave that will push the blood down the arteries and it travels from an area of low resistance at the heart to high resistance as we get towards a periphery. And so that creates the blood flow down the arteries and then the veins return the blood to the heart. 
Prior to making a fistula, the blood flow in the arm arteries, uh, as I said before, travels from an area of low resistance to a, an area of high resistance. So the heart has, you know, a big open area, it's a low resistance, and then as it pushes the blood towards the smaller and smaller capillaries, they create more resistance. And so the blood flow to the from the heart to the hand will travel in a pulse wave and it isn't particularly high flow when we compare it to once an arteriovenous fissure is created. You're looking more in the low hundreds or even below 100 mils per minute in an adult arm. So the types of anastomosis that we see to create a native fistula would be an end to side anastomosis where the vein is taken and cut and the end of the vein is then joined into a hole on the artery. So this is end to side. The other part of the vein is just tied off and it's not, it's not necessary. So that's end to side. So you can see here that the the blood would travel down the artery and then be allowed to pass now back up to the heart via, via the vein. A side-to-side -side anastomosis means that the vein isn't tied off at the distal end. Uh, it's, it's kept open and so the side of the artery is joined to the side of the vein via small holes made by the surgeons. And then blood can flow from the artery and can travel back up the arm or down towards the hand. It can travel in both directions. So that's a side to side. In Australia, we don't see those very often and it really depends on the surgeon choice. The only issue with that is that it, it does allow blood to then travel to the hand and can cause venous hypertension. To create an arteriovenous fistula, the surgeon makes an incision at the point where he wants to join the artery and the vein. He then clamps the artery and the vein and then he creates a very small incision in the artery. He ties off the distal end of the vein and, and cuts it and then takes that end and joins it onto the surgical hole that was created. The vein and artery are sewn together, the clamps are released, and then they monitor the flow and make sure there's no leaks and then they suture up the, the skin. So monitoring the blood flow through an arteriovenous fistula, you see that the blood is, is can travel down the artery towards the anastomosis. You can see this on the video here. Blood will travel down the artery, either the, from the brachial artery, if there's an anastomosis at the brachial artery, it'll then travel through the anastomosis. If there's the anastomosis down at the radial artery, it will travel down a small portion will be continued to the hand at some sometimes, sometimes not much goes back to the hand. And then where the anastomosis is, blood is now able to travel back up the vein and back towards the heart. Once we've done that creation and we allow the blood to go through that anastomosis and back up to the heart, what we've done is we've created a low pressure system now which allows more blood, because of the drop in resistance, more blood will now start to flow down the artery but also back up the vein and towards the heart. So we'll start to see the artery dilate and the vein dilate and the flow of blood increase dramatically, sometimes over, over a thousand mils a minute. It really depends on how big the anastomosis is, how good the arteries are and how good the veins are. And so when we check the flow of blood through a fissure, what we're doing is checking if there's an issue with either the, the pump, the heart, the arteries or the outflow veins. So the volume flow measurement doesn't particularly identify where the issue is, but it does tell us if there's an issue. Once we've anastomosed, uh, if we have a good pump, the heart, a good artery and a good draining vein, we see that the flow increases dramatically in, in that circuit. And this uh, we can check by checking the volume flow and the volume flow measurement will tell it, give us a baseline, the first one that we do, and we would hope that that would be in the range of 
in my units we prefer greater than 400 mils a minute some units prefer greater than 600 mils a minute it really depends and then following doing the baseline measurement we would like to see that that measurement continues to increase as it matures and it doesn't start to drop off if it starts to to become less volume flow we we start to look at causes for why the flow is, has dropped down so if we look at this, the inflow and the outflow, when we talk about inflow and outflow with an AV fissure or an AV graft, we usually refer to the inflow as the, anaster, the arterial inflow, so whichever is the feeding artery, and then also just running into the anastomosis is the area that we would all refer to all of that as inflow. And then outflow, we refer to the vein all the way to the heart. So all of that is outflow vein. So when we talk about an inflow problem or an outflow problem, that's sort of the areas that we're talking about. So on this diagram, you can see that the inflow artery is a brachial artery. It's feeding through the anastomosis. And again, we would continue to call that inflow in dialysis. And then the vein that we would be puncturing for needling and all the way up to the heart would be the outflow. So inflow, outflow. We're just going to look a little bit at the actual flow through the vessels. So the blood flow through the fistula or any vessel in our body has a, a pulsatile flow, but the pulse varies depending on the resistance in, in the vessels and the pulse wave created by the heart beating and, and how it dissipates throughout the body. But it also is affected by uh, any kind of resistance. So if we look at the anastomosis on a native fistula, that creates some resistance and turbulent flow as the blood flows around. And then a nice straight segment vein, like, like here or an artery, we tend to see more laminar flow um, where the blood cells tend to run in a nice laminar line and you'll get a little bit of turbulence along the edges, particularly if the flow is very fast, but you tend to see that the flow is, is fairly laminar and there's not a lot of swirling because the blood cells or the blood's not hitting resistance and swirling around. So this is sort of an image of, of what I would call laminar flow or fairly straight line flow. Whereas you can see in this vessel is another example of, of what we would call uh, non-laminar flow or restricted flow where it's traveling through some resistant areas or some narrowing. When blood is running through a tube and then there's some narrowings in it, uh, that can either be from plaque or what we call neointimal hyperplasia, which causes a lot of the vein stenoses. Once that narrowing gets to less than 50%, you start to see some changes in the flow, the volume flow of the blood because it's, it causes a resistance that slows down the flow in the blood. So you can see here that uh, this, this vessel has some narrowings in it and that flow then not only becomes slowed down, it becomes a bit more turbulent as it hits all of those areas of na narrowing. So that's not as laminar. So as blood flows through a narrowing, the blood flow needs to increase in speed. So sometimes uh, you'll see an ultrasound, a formal ultrasound that'll talk about the velocities. And sometimes in dialysis we get a bit confused because we think that the velocities in centimetres per second relates to the volume flow, but they're completely different measurements. So the volume flow is the actual volume of blood traveling through a vessel in mils per minute. So for example, 400 mils per minute is traveling or 500, 600. Whereas the velocity is how fast the blood is actually traveling in centimeters per second. So if you look at this uh, vessel here, you can see that the lumen narrows and the blood then is running through this vessel and it won't change. 400, 400 mils is running in, 400 mils has to run out, otherwise the vessel would dilate and explode. So the, the volume flow 
will remain unchanged. However, how fast the blood has to run to get that volume of blood through changes. So, for example, in the wider area, 400 mils a minute can run slower, but in a narrowed area, to get 400 mils a minute through a narrowing, it has to run faster. So that's where we see an increase in the velocity where it speeds up in order for the, that amount of blood to fit through the narrowed area. So that's the difference between velocities and volume flow. So that, though, allows us to then measure a volume flow of any kind of fluid travelling through a, a container, you know, a, a pipe or a tube or a vessel, a blood vessel, if we work out the velocity and the diameter in that area that we, we measured the velocity, we can do a calculation to say what volume of fluid, and in this case blood, is travelling through the tube. So narrowings, like I said, increases the blood flow, but what we mean is the blood, the speed of the blood flow. So the volume flow through the changing diameters. So the volume of blood flowing through a vessel remains the same throughout the human system unless there's a significant obstruction or heart issues. So if I have 600 mils a minute running through a fistula vein, so the outflow vein, it would have to remain at 600 mils a minute for the entire outflow vein. It can't be 600 mils in one section and 300 mils a minute in another section because then you would get congestion and dilation and that thing would rupture in no time. So whatever flows in, the same volume will be flowing out. However, the way it travels to have that volume flowing in and out will change. So the speed that it travels through narrower or wider areas will change and this will give you an idea here. So if we look at this 600 mils of fluid travelling through this fairly straight piece of vessel, we'll say this is the artery, then the artery stays at 6 mils, so the 600 mils of fluid will stay the same velocity because it doesn't need to speed up or slow down because it's the same diameter, so it can fit through just as easily. But the wider it goes, so if it went to 12 mil. In diameter, the 600 mils a minute would have to travel a lot slower because you'll get a lot more blood through. If we look at the changing diameters here and the blood travelling through in this video, you can see that as the blood goes into the wider sections, it can travel slower to get, for example, say this was running at 600 mils a minute. The 600 mils a minute travelling through this section is a lot slower than the 600 mils to get through the narrowed sections that you can see there. So it does need to speed up. So that means that the velocities through the narrowings increase. And when we measure the velocities, we need to be really cautious that we measure the diameter that relates to the velocity measurement. So if I do a velocity measurement, for example, here, but measure the diameter here, my calculation is going to be completely wrong. So I must do my velocity measurement exactly in the same area that I've done my diameter measurement. So that's a really important thing to, to do when you're doing your volume flow measurements. So volume flow measurement utilising ultrasound. So we know that there are a few different ways to do volume flow measurements. Uh, in dialysis, we're, in most units, we're familiar with a couple of them. Uh, dilutional measurements where we'll either use an ultrasound and saline as our dilutant or we'll use uh, warmed dialysate as our dilutant to measure the volume flow. But we can only do that on dialysis. So another way that we can do it is to measure utilising ultrasound. So as I've talked about before, the volume of blood flowing through a vascular system can be estimated by measuring the velocity in centimetres per second and the diameter where that velocity was measured. So as I said before, it needs to be very carefully measured. And so this is a little tip to make sure that when you're doing ultrasound volume flow measurements, that you're doing them as, as accurately as possible. So software has been developed to perform the volume flow calculations for us. And what we do is we need to provide a diameter and a velocity. An ultrasound that allows us to measure velocity and we, and has a software package in there to allow us to calculate the volume flow will allow us to do volume flow measurements. So we measure the velocity 
we provide the diameter in the area where we did that velocity measurement and then we ask the machine to calculate by hitting calculate. So there's a few benefits of using ultrasound for blood flow monitoring. It can be measured at any time. Unlike other methods, it can only be performed on dialysis. So if I've got someone who's turned up for dialysis and I'm a bit concerned about their fistula and I'm not sure whether I should actually start the dialysis, whether there's any value, I don't want to put two needles in and, and then start dialysis so I can capture a volume flow measurement before I even start. It also allows us to monitor pre-dialysis patients who've had an arteriovenous fistula or graft created before they start dialysis, we can then start monitoring the volume flow, get a baseline, but also continue to monitor it if they don't start. It allows the measurement of the volume flow in specific vessels. Uh, one of the problems that I have with the dilutional method is that I have a lot of vessels where we're cannulating into two different sections. So I might cannulate in the forearm and use my venous outflow needle in the upper arm and there's a basilic outflow in the, in the middle of that. So it doesn't give me an accurate volume flow measurement. And those people, I either have to try to put two needles in the one vessel to do their measurement on the day, or if someone who's not aware that there's a collateral in between goes and does a measurement that looks all of a sudden like the volume flows change dramatically. So if I have two branches and I'm trying to get the surgeon to tie one off, I can measure both branches and, and let them know which one has the higher volume flow and which is the one which may be the best one to tie off. It only takes a few minutes to perform the measurement. So it's quick and easy. Once you've had a lot of practice, uh, it's quite straightforward. I can also do the measurement in the brachial artery while they're on dialysis without slowing down the patients getting on dialysis. It does require training to ensure the accuracy of the measurement. So we'll talk about some real things that we can look at that will improve your measurements, will ensure they're as accurate as possible. So that's some of the things we'll discuss further on. And they're less accurate if they're measured in an area of high velocity or turbulent flow. So it is a, it is a measurement, so we do need to be cautious that we get the best measurement that we can get when we make our calculations. So the equipment that we would need to be able to do volume flow measurements with ultrasounds are an ultrasound system uh, with a transducer, it would also need software included in it to allow it to do colour, pulse wave Doppler and volume flow calculations. So those sometimes you need to request to be added on. They aren't always included in the bundle that you buy, but I usually just make sure that when I look at the bundles and, and look at it, that I compare and find the system that I want that has all of those things included or ask for them as add-ons and get the quote for all of them. So blood flow sampling through an arteriovenous fistula, the inflow, we have the pulsatile arterial flow. It, it does change a little bit from a, a, an artery once we do anastomose it to the outflow vein. The resistance drops a little bit, so you'll see that the arterial pulse wave in an artery attached to a, an AV fistula is slightly different to your artery without a fissure attached to it. The anastomosis area, it has arterial flow, but it can be very turbulent. So it's very hard to get a good velocity measurement in there because the blood is, is, is running all over the place and spinning around. And then in the outflow, it, it's a little bit pulsatile, but it doesn't have your real peaked pulse wave. It's more of a, a monophase just a phasic sort of flow and that peters often becomes uh, just a really damp and phasic flow as it gets closer and closer to the heart. So if we look at this, this is the pulse pulsatile arterial blood flow here and that's measured in the area just prior to the inflow and you can see that you've got your nice peaked pulse waves there and that's a nice capture of a pulse flow there. And then this 
is in the anastomotic area and this is actually not particularly bad for anastomotic area um, you can see this is obviously a little bit away from the curve here it's in a straighter line away from the curve if you tend to capture the curve you'll see that it's it's very hard to get rid of the artifact it's very turbulent in that area and it's 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 not a great place to be doing measurements because they won't be particularly accurate and then the phasic venous outflow and you can see like I said here that's really just slow waves in the outflow section it's not particularly pulsatile which is what we want of a fissure we don't want it to be pulsatile because that'll be telling us there's something going on and this again is not too bad an area to be doing a measurement because you can see that the vessel has quite nice laminar flow the walls are particularly irregular but in a lot of our fissures we know particularly the native fissures but also grafts that have been cannulated heavily there are areas in that outflow vein or outflow graft segment that have very irregular walls and so you can imagine it would be very hard to get a good accurate measurement so Doppler Doppler software can measure the velocity of blood flow much like a policeman with a radar gun. It measures the flow coming towards or away from the transducer face, but it cannot measure blood flow at a perpendicular angle. So you can see here the images, you can see as the blood travels towards the probe, it's able to capture it. As it travels away from the probe, it'll capture, but if it's straight up and down, it do, it's not able to measure it. So we always need to have a little tilt on our probe when we're measuring. The blood flow going towards the transducer face is assigned a positive number. You can see that here, there it's 18. And the blood flow going away from the transducer is given a negative number, so negative 18. And you can really just uh, tilt your probe slightly so that you can have it angling towards or away from the probe. It's displayed in a colour Doppler map or a spectral waveform graph using the pulse wave Doppler. So you can see here your pulsed wave, which is a nice pulse wave there. And again, once you start to do the measurements, you'll know that you're getting a really good reading when you have these really nicely defined pulse waves. So if we look at this sample of Doppler measurement, the blood flow towards the transducer the arterial flow, you can see that I have the transducer tilted here and any blood travelling towards the transducer would be displayed as red and that would give us an image that would look red and then the venous flow is travelling away from the transducer and so it's assigned a blue colour uh, or a negative number. So that's, that's one way. You can see in this second example the probe is now tilted in the opposite direction and you can see there that the arterial blood would be flowing away from the transducer and the venous blood would be flowing towards the transducer. So in this scenario, the arterial blood would be assigned a, a blue colour and a negative number and the venous would be assigned a red or a positive. So it really just depends on your decision of which way you want to tilt your probe or which way the colours will show. You can also invert it so that if you prefer to always have your arterial as red and your venous as blue and you've got it tilted the wrong way, you can invert it so that it reflects that. Then when you do perpendicular, with the transducer perpendicular, the system can't tell what is to way and what is from because you're pointing completely at 90 degrees. So you can imagine there that it can't tell what's travelling to or away, so it, it's not able to assign it a colour or anything. So it'll display no colour on the spectral waveform. So you need an angle. So when you're doing your measurements, uh, it's, we're used to in dialysis tending to just uh, use B mode, so it doesn't, we're not that familiar and we, we tend to to forget that we do actually need to tilt our probe so that we can then work out which is towards and which is away and also then be able to do a flow measurement because it needs to be able to measure the velocity. So you can see here that the probe on the arm, it, it's pressing down a little bit and you would need to do what we call heel to toe, which would be to push one side and you can see the video here 
one side tilt it so that that means that blood would either be flowing towards or away from it. Always angle with the vessel and angle the colour box. It's important to remember that if we're doing this, if we don't have a lot of gel, we tend to be pushing down on the skin. And that's not such an issue with an artery, which doesn't tend to compress easily, but with our fistula veins, which are soft and low pressure, we can actually compress the vessel and change the flow dynamics. So it's really important that we have a lot of gel so that we're able to create that tilt without pushing down on the vessel and, and compressing the vessel. So colour Doppler, the velocity is actually displayed in the colour map in centimetres per second. And this is adjustable. So the venous or low flow states and the arterial high flow state. So aliasing occurs if flow is faster than the set scale. So we need to adjust our scale. So if the flow is, is really fast, we need to adjust, adjust up to capture that. So you can see here there's aliasing. So the scale's been set too low for the true velocity flow. So what it's doing, and you can see here the flow here is seven centimetres per second or negative seven centimetres per second, and you can see there's a lot of aliasing here. So we need to be adjusting this so that it's it's higher, maybe 18 or higher. We just keep adjusting until we get a nice laminar flow and we don't have all that yellows and whites and blues. Uh, we, we want to get just the all blue or all or red. Sometimes the, the turbulence and the velocity is just too high and we struggle, but usually we need to adjust that so that we really get that correct. So aliasing is often seen in turbulent flow or when your scale is set too low. So when you put it on, just set your scale, adjust it um, to ensure that, that you get it to the best you can. So velocity may also be displayed and measured using pulse wave Doppler shown on the spectral waveform. So it's measured in centimetres per second and aliasing may also occur if the scale is set too low. So again here, you can see that over on the side here we're talking, it's got the scale of velocity in centimetres per second. And again, if this is adjusted too low, you'll find you'll get aliasing. Um, so you need to set, set, set it so that you get the whole sort of waveform in, in the screen, so you may need to dial it up or down so you can adjust that. So I've talked a little bit about uh, ultrasound volume flow measurements and the importance of, of accurate measurement. Um, when it is a user-dependent method, if we are measuring our diameters incorrectly or we're measuring into areas with a lot of turbulence and and uh, aliasing, we may not be getting the best measurements that we can get. So uh, there's some tips that I've got. So number one is avoid turbulent areas like the anastomosis or anywhere with irregular walls or an irregular diameter vein. You can imagine, for example, here, if I was to try and do a velocity measurement here and then do the diameter, and I was just a millimetre left or right of where I did the velocity measurement, the turbulent flow, um, would mean that my measurements could be slightly out. And we know that if we measure the walls incorrectly, we may end up with an incorrect volume flow measurement. It's harder to get an accurate diameter measurement if we're choosing these irregular walled areas, so particularly where we're cannulating or in, in the anastomosis area where it's curved, you know, we may not measure directly the diameter that we should be so there's an increased risk of operator-dependent variability in those areas. So you know we really need to be looking at areas that have a, not a nice straight wall. So turbulent flow may also cause the velocity measurement to be less accurate. So again, if the blood is travelling along the vessel, I'll just get if it's travelling along and then it starts to roll around in these sort of wider walled areas it's not going to be as accurate as if it's travelling in a straight line towards and away from the probe. So it's important that we try to pick areas where there's less turbulent flow um, and make sure that we're really getting the best velocity measurements. 
Then also soft aneurysmal vein, it's easier to accidentally compress it during the measurement. So your big dilated veins, just a little bit of pressure from your probe or trying to do your heel toe, that tilt will change the, the diameter and change the, you know, the way that the blood's flowing through that vessel and, and then may mess with our measurements. Inflow measurements are more accurate than outflow measurements. So I recommend using the inflow arteries, particularly the big brachial artery to do your volume flow measurements because you've got a nice laminar flow. It, the walls are fairly regular and it's a lot easier to do an accurate measurement into those areas. The only thing is obviously that the amount of blood running down a, a brachial artery is slightly different to the amount that's running in the fistula. But when we're talking about doing trends of volume flow measurements where we're looking at a trend which maybe, you know, for example, it was 1,000 mils a minute five months ago and then it was 800 mils a minute, then it was 600 mils a minute, we know something's going on. So when I'm looking at trends, it's not particularly an issue because whatever's running down the brachial artery, those sorts of flows... If it slows down, it's because the fish are slowing down. It's not because the feed to the hand is slowing down. So performing the measurement, it's really important with any ultrasound that we follow the same principles of ergonomics, that we make sure we set the environment up really well, make sure that the arm or the leg that we're planning to scan is in our line of sight of the ultrasound. We're not having to try and turn around to look at the ultrasound, that we line it all up. Uh, and also seat yourself and have yourself at the right height so that you don't cause any strain to yourself. Scan the arm, the artery and the vein. If it's a fissure or a graft, you start and you scan the lot and then try and pick the best area. So preferably the larger non-calcified artery like the brachial artery is better than using a radial artery. If you've got a radiocephalic fissure but the radial artery is quite small and calcified and has turbulent flow, again, it's really difficult to get an accurate diameter and an accurate velocity there. So sometimes it's better to scan and have a good look and pick your best. And the best might be the brachial artery. And what I do then is I just document that that's where I've done the measurement. So when I continue to do more measurements to get a trend, I go back to the same place. Use a light touch. Remember not to compress the vein or it will distort the measurements. Use lots of gel to allow you to angle the probe in the gel without compressing the low pressure veins. And you can see that example of that here. So performing the measurement, choose the area with laminar flow and you can see here the example, it, you know, preferably we'd like it to be all red or all blue, whichever way you're around, whichever way you got it and not like this if I was doing a measurement in here or if I saw a volume flow measurement and this is what it looked like I would be a bit suspicious that it was accurate. So measure the volume flow in the artery or any laminar segment of the graft, the fish, uh, the vein segment. Uh, it's good to do both if you're doing a baseline and if you have two big branches it's good to measure both branches if you can but if it's not possible to get a segment of outflow vein that's that's really suitable, I, I just avoid doing it all together and just do the brachial artery, but it really is dependent. But then make sure that you know where you did the measurements. Don't just put inflow or outflow. I would put, you know, brachial artery two centimetres above elbow crease or outflow vein mid forearm, things like that, so that we knew that we were measuring in similar areas. And just a tip, the flow in the brachial artery will not be less than the flow in the outflow vein. So if you measured a brachiocephalic fissure and you measured the outflow cephalic vein volume flow and it was 1,000 mils a minute and then you measured the brachial artery and it was 500 mils a minute, we, we know that that's not possible because the flow to the fissure has to have come from the brachial artery. So the brachial artery can't be running at 500 mils a minute and then have the fissure running at a 1,000 because it, all the fissure flow has to come from the artery. So that's a good way to test, you know, so sometimes doing the inflow and outflow is good. Uh, I do see formal ultrasound sometimes where they note that the inflow is 500 mils a minute and the outflow is 
a thousand mils a minute and I know then to go and look at their actual images because I know that the measurements weren't correct because the inflow brachial artery can't be 500 and the outflow be a thousand. It's just not possible. And usually what I find then is that they've measured the outflow just at the anastomosis in a very turbulent area. So actually performing the volume flow measurement. So this is a video here of performing the measurement. So you, so performing the volume flow measurement. So this is just a video of actually performing the measurement. So you capture the image. I'm not going to talk about the steps to do the volume flow measurements in, in this video because uh, different ultrasounds are different. So I just recommend that you uh, look at your manual or you speak to the rep if you've not done them or speak to a sonographer who would be happy to train you how to do the, the measurement. But basically, you would just need to use the ultrasound to measure the diameter, capture the velocity and then calculate the volume flow measurement. It's really important. I prefer to do my measurement of my blood vessel in B mode without the colour because sometimes the aliasing in the colour can make it hard to get the true diameter of the vessel. So I think it's really important if possible to do your diameter measurement in B mode without colour superimposed because that can make it a little bit tricky. So then once you've got the volume flow measurements, you can document the results. I create a spreadsheet just in Excel. Again, it's probably a good idea to document the date, at least the date, what the measurement was and, and where that measurement in the inflow or outflow vein was performed so that people can, you know, re relate it. Because I think particularly if you're doing an outflow vein that we know uh, is uh, is only one lumen of two lumens. So, you know, in the median cubital, you're measuring the basilic outflow limb rather than the cephalic limb. So it's important to document where you are measuring them. Or if you're just doing the brachial artery, then it's good for the next person measuring to make sure that they do the same. A single volume flow measurement has a lot less value than a trend. If I have a one-off measurement and it's 600 mils a minute, if it was always 600 mils a minute, I wouldn't at all be concerned. But if it was 2,000 mils a minute six months ago and all of a sudden it was 600, that's much more concerning. So it's really important to, to do these measurements regularly. So uh, routine surveillance, you know, part of your surveillance is to do them routinely. It will not only help you intervene appropriately, it will also stop you from intervening inappropriately. Because if you are constantly measuring and it's always 600, you're less likely want to go ahead and do something because it's actually been stable. So I set up a protocol for ongoing monitoring of volume flow to help identify the volume flow that's trending down. So you can see these two examples here that, like I said here, it was 1,600 mils a minute, but it was trending down. And so then when it got to 450 mils a minute, uh, we did a formal ultrasound, found a stenosis and did an angioplasty, whereas you can see that this fissure from the day it was made was 450, 500 mils a minute, and there was no intervention needed. Just some clinical pearls. The first one would be plan your measurement site. So really look at the each individual arteriovenous fissure and graft, look at whether it's a radiocephalic fissure or if it's a brachiocephalic fissure, scan the entire inflow artery and outflow vein or veins and pick the best sites for measurement. Look at if it's a brachiocephalic or a radiocephalic fissure. And then also look at the documentation and see if there's been volume flow measurements with ultrasound before, where were they doing those? and see whether it's important to stay in the same sites or maybe it's not possible anymore because the outflow vein has been over cannulated and is now quite dilated and unusual. So avoid turbulent areas, so particularly the anastomosis in that area there, it's very turbulent or any 
any stenotic areas or where it bifurcates or big aneurysmal areas and things like that. Avoid anywhere uh, uh, where the vein walls are very jagged or, or change dramatically. Again, it's very hard to get an absolute diameter where you did the velocity measurement when you do that. Don't compress the low pressure veins. Again, if you compress your vein slightly, it, it, it's no longer a circle and then your diameter measurement is going to be incorrect. So it's really important that you use a lot of gel and when you do your heel to toe to get the flow to and from the probe, you're tilting it in the gel, not pressing on the, vest, on the skin and compressing the vein and causing a, a, a variation in the velocity or the flow. The flow in from the artery will not be less than the flow in the outflow vein, so that's important. Um, if you're doing a radial artery inflow, then the flow in the fissure can sometimes be slightly more because the, there can be blood coming from the ulnar artery and through the palmar arch and back up through the fissure. And that's why, I, if possible, I try to stick to the brachial artery if I'm trying to look at comparison because I know that everything that goes down the brachial artery is going to feed the fissure in some way or another. And if my outflow measurement is more than my inflow measurement, I know I'm not getting it right. While learning the skill, compare your measurement with other volume flow measurements such as dilutional methods if you've got those available to you in your unit. I used to use the ultrasound dilution method and then compare it to my ultrasound volume flow measurements to just um, sort of as a double check to make sure that I, I was doing them correctly. And I found that I, they were very, very similar. I didn't find much variation once I got my technique uh, down pat. You just be mindful that sometimes we have been doing the dilutional measurements and there's been a branch in between, so our dilutional measurements were actually not correct. So be, be really mindful of the anatomy of the fissure that you're doing. So if you're doing an ultrasound measurement of the area where you're cannulating and it comes up at 600 mils a minute and then you do a dilutional one and it's always over a 1,000, have a look then probably is a collateral or a branch between and so your dilutional one's actually been incorrect all along. So that's really important to know your anatomy. So that's all the clinical pearls. The best thing is to get the ultrasound and practice. I like to measure my pre-dialysis patients, use a brachial artery and get my technique down pat with the brachial artery because it's a nice vessel to to measure because it's got nice laminar wall like sorry, laminar flow and the walls are nice and straight. Uh, and then, you know, with the new fistulas, they do still have nice straight walls and lamina, but they can be softened and you do need to be mindful, but it's good to practice on them, doing your heel to toe, using lots of gel and not distorting the vein when you're doing your measurements. And then when the people are on dialysis so that you're not interfering with their dialysis time, I put them on dialysis with their needles in and then, if it's possible, I do uh, ultrasound measurements of their brachial artery so that I can still get in and do that even though the needles are in, they're not in the way, and I can do the brachial artery measurements without making them wait to start on dialysis. So practice, practice, uh, compare it with other methods and speak to other nurses who've maybe used it before or go and visit your sonographers in your ultrasound department and see if they'd be prepared to sit with you to do some practice with them. Thank you for your time.